Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, we're going to begin this morning study with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are very grateful for the time we have this morning to open your word together and uh, to receive the light that you have for us. Um, we pray, Lord, for each person that your Holy Spirit can speak to them, uh, to their particular need, and that you can bring conviction and power into their lives. We ask, Lord, that um, you can help us to sort through the things that we are studying, uh, the puzzles that we are trying to unravel. Um, and we know, Lord, that you have uh, light, precious light for us. We ask that we can uh, value the things that you are showing us. Be with us now in this study. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. Now, um, what we've been trying to do has been... taking these story of Gideon and, and sorting it out on two different lines. And um, I've puzzled over this quite a bit. I don't know if I fully understand what it is we're looking at. But part of the problem is um, when we take Judges 6, 7, and 8, we're saying that it's two different lines and that we can take the same story and we can give it uh, within that seven, seven, seven days. Uh, we can give, give it uh, different dates. Um, that is different events. One line is internal. The other is external. One addresses a July 18 prediction itself, Nashville. The other one deals with the Trump prediction. Uh, they represent two different classes. And... Um, uh, so in, in trying to figure that out from this text, I mean, that's the premise that we, we started with on, on this. Um, and so I, I still haven't figured out how we do that, how we do that from, from the text itself, how we show that uh, a text can represent two different way marks in the same line. Um, so that's what we're trying to do. And where we had finished off yesterday is we were uh, we were addressing this uh, separation of these groups, the 32,000, uh, where 22,000 leave. And we got a symbol of, uh, with the 22 and the 10, we had a symbol of October 22. And, and that would usually bring us to uh, the end of the lines so that would be the way mark that would be um uh, you know the sunday law yet um there is some some points regarding that um so we had the midst of the week symbol and we had it in a couple of different ways i don't remember exactly how we did that i know that we had uh the thirty-one thousand seven hundred represented the midst of the week and then we also took uh, from, uh, what did we do? What was the other thing we did, Stephen? Do you remember what you did right at the yeah. end? Uh, yeah, I just had mentioned the. 22,000 and 10,000, and then you mentioned the 21,400. Um, yeah, is there something so, else on top of that? Yeah, so taking 300 from the 22,000 gives us that. So, so we, um, so we got the symbol of uh, 217, so July uh, 21, and then there was one more step. What was the, the third one? I thought there was another one. I mean, I could look no, at I it. I can't remember. Let's see if I can find this. 
I know you're talking about the 55th week and the 56th week, the beginnings and the endings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we talked about that, taking the 777 and dividing it, and that put December 6th in that line um, as the center, at the, right after the center, which follows July 18th. So there's lots here in Judges chapter 7 that uh, we, we really don't uh, and I had this open and then I closed it. So uh, yeah, so the other one was to ask that make that comment. So we get the 62 weeks you cut in half and you get the 31. So that was, um, yeah. So if we take 300 from the 22,000, you get 2170. That's the midst of the 62 weeks. You take 62 weeks and you get that symbol. So that was all I did. Um, and this was also, we had Judges 7, verse 10, that gave us the 10th day of the seventh month. So we had October 22, we had the midst of the week, we had the Day of Atonement symbol, uh, and those were all, all derived from uh, Judges chapter 7, uh, dealing with this separation that happens of the 300, right? <clears throat> now, in these lines, so let's go to these lines then. Where do we have our, oops, it's not where I want to go, uh, right here. So where do we have October 22 symbolized in, in these lines? Anybody remember? Well, you just said uh, Judges 7.10, but I'm so dense right now, I don't see that as I'm looking at Judges 7.10. No, Judges 7.10 is just a symbol of July 8, of uh, the 10th day of the seventh month. Okay. All right. That's all I'm just saying. Um, now, so remember, December 25th, 2020 is the 10th day of the 10th month. Right, so that's a symbol of the siege. But the siege of Washington occurs on January 6th. On the biblical calendar, that's gonna be the 22nd day of the 10th month. Right? That's one thing we noticed? Right. Okay, so, so what we have to do, I think, with judges, uh, six, seven, and eight. It's also um, the Julian Day. Uh, is that the Julian Day number or something? Iran? Uh, okay, yeah, so just the last three digits of the Julian Day are 220. Okay, so the Julian Day number, the last three digits are 220. Okay, um, so that's a, a Julian Day number count. Uh, so anyway with with judges six seven and eight there are so many different symbols and you know fitting them into these lines it, i mean it's just very thick it's very dense um with symbolism now in trying to sort out because we have the jerobail and the gideon that's nashville and Trump, that's internal and external. It's the, um, the foolish and the wise, 
right? So we have all these ways in which we look at these two different lines, which are really the same line, but just illustrating in that history, different uh, details. Um, so I don't, I still don't know the best way to approach this because it's just so much to sort out. So one of the things that we had, Judges 7, verse 18, when I blow a trumpet, I and all that are with me, then blow ye trumpets, blow ye the trumpets also on every side of all the camp and say the sword of the Lord and the sword of Gideon. So this is a Gideon giving these instructions. Now, previous to that, he's going to take these 300 and he's going to divide them into three companies. So he put a trumpet in every man's hand with empty, empty pitchers and lamps with, within the pitchers. And he just tells them to do likewise. And then he's going to instruct them about blowing the trumpet on uh, in Judges 7.18. So that, that aligns with July 18. And then... Uh, they're going to go through this process. He's going to take the hundred men that were with him. Um, they came onto the outside of the camp in the beginning of the middle watch. Now, what, what's the middle watch? How many watches are there in this period of Jewish history? Shouldn't there be four? No. Nope. That's, that's would, it, would, it be, would it be midnight? Well, there's actually three watches. Uh, the four watch system didn't happen until the, the Roman captivity. So the Romans brought in the idea of four watches, but the Jews always had th three watches. So that's why there's a middle watch. <clears throat> so, um, so if you have three watches, you divide the night into three watches. So the night roughly is, well, it's 12 hours. The hour lengths change depending on the time of the year. So that would be noon, the, then, wouldn't it? I'm what's sorry. that? That would be noon, wouldn't it? No, this is nighttime. So, it's, it's, so you have three watches. You're going to take those 12 hours and divide them into four-hour segments. So this would be 10 o'clock at night, at 10 p.m., beginning of the middle watch. Um, uh, and they had but newly set the watch, right? So that means they just put the watchman there. And, and so just when they made this, this change, they just put those men in place. Then they blew the trumpets, break the pitchers that were in their hands. Now, why did they choose this time? What would be the strategy there? Would they be less attentive at that time? That could be one way of looking at it. Yeah. Now, of course, when you think about the night being divided into 12 hours, I mean, people, I mean, life was different before we had artificial light. Um, I read some studies about uh, how people lived prior to artificial light because um, it's a pretty modern idea. I mean, even at one time people had lamps, but they were, fairly expensive to operate. So people would generally, you know, wind down their evening. When it got dark, they'd go to bed. They'd actually wake up in the middle of the night for a while. Um, just because, you know, you're not going to sleep for 12 hours. Um, but, uh, you know, so you try to think about how we do things and how they would do things in those days. So, um that first group, that's the first watch. So they're going to be the watch once it gets dark. So, so it's going to get dark. They're going to be watching. And they're going to be getting tired. And, and maybe the other group would have gone to bed for a bit. Now they're going to get up. 
everybody's sort of a little bit groggy. They're not, they're not alert. And, th and that would be what I, I think is happening. But how would that apply just prophetically? What would be the significance of this prophetically? Um, Well, it's a call to the sleeping virgins, if you want to extend it that far. Okay. They all slumbered and slept. Okay, arise, or the bridegroom's coming. Okay. I don't, I don't know if I'd put the virgins here, but maybe. Um, but can we see that there's sort of a change in the watch? So what would the change in the watch refer to? Two classes of watchers? I don't know. I mean, we are the watchmen. I mean, here this obviously is referring to Midian. Um, but the idea of a watchman is a part of this message. Okay. Um, I know I'm, I'm just thinking here. So if we're taking uh, the verses, Judges 7, verse 18, 19, 20, 21, these are going to all deal with, um, and 22, Um, so you got you got a number of verses here that address this. So we know that the Midianites are going to set every man's sword against his fellow, even throughout all the hosts. So they're going to fight against each other, and they're going to flee to all these different places, uh, four different places. And, and then we know the men of Israel are going to gather themselves together out of Naphtali, out of Asher, out of all Manasseh, and pursue after the Midianites. So even though they have these 300 here at the beginning who blow the trumpets, they're going to be joined by um, these, these groups of people that are going to be people that are, who are these people? Naphtali, Asher, Manasseh. And then there's going to be a call to a uh, messenger sent to Mount Ephraim. Okay, so, so what's going on here? How do we understand these symbols relating to this movement? Now, who did uh, who did um, uh, Gideon originally call? Those within the surrounding tribes. Okay, so you're going to have uh, specifically Asher, Zebulun, Naphtali, right, and Manasseh. Right. Okay. So you got these four tribes, then they're going to be um, 
of those tribes, there's going to be 32,000, right? Right. No, it doesn't specifically tell us that. It just tells us that when they uh, he sends them home, there's going to be 22,000 sent home. And there's going to remain 10,000. And then you're going to have um, the division, of course, of the 300. But after these trumpets are blown and this battle begins with the Midianites, uh, as the men flee, um, the tribes that are going to join in pursuing them are Naphtali, Asher, and Manasseh. But it doesn't mention Zebulun. So why is that? I mean, I have a specific answer that I want, but I don't know if anybody will think of it. Didn't Zebulun kind of reject this message? Okay, well, what we have to look at is how how did Odilio use Zebulun? I'm not directly recalling. Okay, so he had taken the numbering of the tribe of Zebulun, 57,400. And he's going to uh, take each of those men to represent a day. And he's going to go from the naming of the Seventh-day Adventist Church on May 23rd, 1863. So that's the, that's the date sometime given for the official uh, organization of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. That's when the Seventh-day Adventist Church is organized. That's the last day of that general conference in 1863. And he's going to count 57,400 days to July 18. So what would be the significance of that then? The fact that Zebulun does not join in pursuing. So here's that chart. With well, the I, I, I suppose it could mean those that had followed along so long and then they lost lost faith in 718 having any validity. Or they it didn't turn out the way they wanted it to, and so they just dropped out. Yeah, so, I mean, that would be my initial guess at, you know, what that would mean. But it's also connected to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And, and so those would be ones that went back, back to the church. Because did that happen? Quite a number of times, yes. Yeah. But specifically with July 18 disappointment, there's people who just disappeared. You know, they immediately left the movement, and some of them directly went back to the church. So, so that's a possibility of why Zebulun is left out in pursuing. So this pursuing must refer to some type of search or study. Would that be reasonable? It's to apply it that way. I think it's reasonable, yeah. And, and then we also have um, this call to Ephraim. And so... 
we've seen Ephraim before, right? So Ephraim keeps showing up. Um, and in this progressive way of rejecting um, the message, right? So Ephraim represents who specifically? Now, in this case, Ephraim is going to be appeased, right, by Gideon's response. Correct. Okay. That, that's so is, he, is Ephraim representing the church at large? Well, that that I'm, I'm not sure of. I know it, it, uh, it does represent a group that eventually completely rejects the message. But at this point, they... They don't seem to have rejected the message. But but they aren't participating in, uh, because the way that we looked at it before is it represented those in the movement that were um, wanting to, to have everything made easier, um, they complained that they weren't really being called when they were called, right? So obviously they were inattentive to the call. Um, but eventually they're just going to all fall away, right? They're, they're going to become the enemies against the message, right? So that's how we understood it before. Um, so I think that's a reasonable way to look at it. Now, when we deal with that, that is chapter eight. In chapter eight, we took as a zoom into the third angel's message arriving. So that brings us to December 25th, 2021. And we deal with that. Um, but all we what we get here is that they are called um, in chapter seven. Now, so the thing is, trying to sort these out between these two lines, um, because with July 18th, um, we have this, this study. So this is representing a study that's supposed to occur. And, and both of these lines represent this. But what did happen in the movement was the December 6th, 2020 um, waymark, the formalization of the second angel's message. And that's going to be marked by the declaration. Um, so that's really the, the midst of the week. That's This is related to July 18th. That is a symbol of the midst of the week. Even though it's not literally the midst. It is... Um, attached to it, right? And we have that, you know, even in that uh, July 21st, 1844, three days before is this July 18 date. And so this seems to represent this history. Um, so this would be an about, so this is about something that happens internally within the movement, right? The response to the call, um, those that join, Right. Um, in pursuit. So this is really about what's happening internally, not, not so much externally. So we would have to take those symbols and attach them to this line, to December 6th, and and then December 25th um, is going to be it, this, you know, this is when Nashville is bombed. Not that that's, you know, the fulfillment of July 18th. But it shows us, it was something that showed us that July 18th was correct, both in the 187 days from the public publication of the ad, but also in uh, the symbols of December 25th, which relates to the end of this line, and the fact that we have a bombing in Nashville. So we have, in this case, we have an external event witnessing to this line, even though this is an internal line. Um, the significance of that really only matters to us. 
where in the line below, these are major events. Um, and, and even this, of course, the bombing of Nashville, its connection to January 6th. So you got the 10th day of the 10th month and the 22nd day of, of uh, the 10th month, 13 days later, because that 13 days is inclusive. Um, and uh, we have all these symbols of July 18th here in this history, in this, in this line. But this is the line about searching for truth. This is about the internal investigation of truth, this pursuit uh, to understand the truth that Zebulun does not participate in. And, and people end up going back to the church. Hmm. So, so the question is, can we take these things that we've been doing? D does this make sense in these lines that we can switch back and forth between the different lines with this story? And then we have the, the issue of Gideon's ephod in chapter 8, which we're going to have to deal with again on these lines. But um, let's go back here. Um so Gideon defeats the Midianites, right? They blow the trumpets. Uh, there's going to be this situation with uh, Orb and Zeb, which we dealt with in great detail before. Um, and that's going to be where uh, um, what was the issue with Orb and Zeb again? Just so everybody's reminded of it. Right, so they're going to send these messengers throughout Mount Ephraim. And so they're, they're going to come, and they're going to take the two princes of Orb and Zeb and kill them upon the rock orb, um, or Orb they killed upon the rock orb. And Zeb they slew at the winepress of Zeb and pursued Midian and brought the heads of Orb and Zeb to Gideon on the other side of the Jordan. Right now, they're going to complain and say that they weren't originally called. Right. They were just called after this situation. But what was what was the real situation with Ephraim? Were, had they been originally called? Yes. OK. So why did they say they weren't? And why why is it after this that they after they kill Orb and Z, why are they then complaining that they weren't originally called? What was the reason? I've always taken it that they just wish to, to shift the blame to somebody else. Okay. Yeah. So so they had been called but they weren't really that interested in what was happening. Now, I don't know what this necessarily represents. I mean, this is representing a message, right? Because remember, these are not, even though we connect them with people, it's people who are bearing a certain message, a certain attitude. It's not individuals. You know, you're not like of the tribe of Ephraim or the tribe of Zebulun or anything like that. Um, but we're going to have this uh, this complaint, and Gideon is going to pacify them in his response. Right, God hath delivered into your hands the princes of Midian and Oreb and Zeb. And what was I able to do in comparison of you? Then their anger was abated toward him when he had said that. Now, so... You know, I'm struggling with this quite a bit in that I don't have I don't have as clear cut answers as I would like. Um, 
So what would the slain of Oreb and Zeb represent as a message? The way that we looked at it before is this had to do with these two different messages. Uh, if I remember correctly, we applied these to Colin's message and Odilio's message. Um, So we had, and we had done this with Penuel and Sukoth as well. So we had these, um, this, this connection here. When we looked, when we zoomed into the December 25th, 2021 Waymark, we saw that there was uh, groups. So we had Penuel and Sukoth being um, the American and the Canadian group, so to speak. That is the different uh, positions or attitudes that are, are generally seen in the American group and the Canadian group, which are a little bit different, though similar. Um, and then we had, of course, Orb and Zeb. Now, we don't see them here on this chart, but the understanding is that was connected to... Um, December 25th, 2021 to February 12th, 2022. So that's going to be Colin's message and Odilia's message. If I remember correctly, I know we discussed it and whether we came to an agreement on that or not, or whether even I settled on that or not, I can't remember. And then we're going to look at Zeba and Zalmuna, and they're going to basically parallel that same idea. So, so we have this Zeba and, and Zalmuna, who are, so we, we had the princes of Midian, Orb and Zeba, and now we have these kings of the Midianites, Zeba and Zalmuna. Um, but this is something being pursued by Gideon's message that um, others are not going to want to join in, right? So the princes of Sukkoth and the men of Penuel both refuse to pursue this direction. <clears throat> so how would this be illustrated on these two lines? Because on these lines, we don't have this, this detail regarding, um, so this would all really be a zoom into the third angel's message. In some ways, um, when we draw out these lines and we have the seven way, way marks and we have the third angel's message arriving, these lines are really incomplete. That is, what should happen that we, we really haven't been doing with these lines is extending them in this way and then putting a repeat of history. Because I don't think this is something this movement fully understands yet, but if we did this, what is this information telling us? So if I did that with this line, and I would do it with the next line as well. Okay, what are we doing here? What, what are we looking at when we put the fourth angel arrives? So we got an eighth way mark, so to speak.
Now in Millerite history, so if we if we looked at this as being Millerite history, as the seven way marks in Millerite history, and we look at the fourth, what is that? Beyond it being a repeat of the second. Okay, so it's a repeat of the second angel's message. In so so we know that um, there's supposed to be a completion of that third angel's message, right? That the third angel's message arrives October 22, 1844. It's under the time of the seventh trumpet now. The seventh trumpet is now sounding. And um, Adventism is looking for Christ to return shortly, right? So they, they know that Christ began his work in the Day of Atonement. And some people are trying to set time for that. And Ellen White says, you know, we can't. Okay, so we can't set time. But people are going to continue setting time. And so the way that we address this in this movement is we paralleled it with the Adventist history, where they were studying and we were trying to follow the same counsel that Ellen White had, had given as an example of what we are to do. That is to study. So that's why we've been studying for nearly three years. So we're following that, that counsel. Now we know that um, most of the Millerites are going to reject the light the light in regard to the sanctuary and the Sabbath, these two main uh, doctrines of, of Adventism. And then there, so there's going to be a falling away that occurs, right? After the disappointment, you have a falling away. And then um, you have this, this, this history that doesn't, that fails, right? So you have a failure. Now, of course, in that failure, there's either a destruction of a building or a construction of a building. So it's either going to be construction or destruction. They're really the same symbol. And, and so what happens in this history after the third angel arrives is you have, you're going to have a rejection of the first and second angel's messages, for one. And then you're going to have the establishment of the Adventist church. Now, when we look at this history, what we would do, what, what, what people should have answered is this is a repeat of history, and this is our history, right? But this is, you know, 9-11 or the Sunday law or something like that. But yet, in order to get to this point, you have to have a history that is really a falling away. So this fourth angel arriving, so if I moved it over here, this is 1863. Now we also saw in, in our Friday night studies that that's 1893. And, it, and it's also 9-11. How can these all be correct? If this is the decrees, you're going to have the, the first, second, and third decrees, and then you're going to have the fourth. Now, the fourth decree is not really a repeat of history, though it is in part, but it's actually part of the falling away. So you're going to have Ezra and Nehemiah, those two different decrees. They're going to build the streets and walls. Right, That's the establishment of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And then you're going to have the four generations leading up to the time of Christ. So if you're going to look at this history, this history here is going to be um, not the repeat of history that we have in our time. So this is the history. If we're going to take this as Millerite history, this would be our history. But there is a history that precedes it. 
And in our movement, um, we have the same thing happening. After December 25th, 2021, um, we're, we're in this history now. Now, this is the Sunday law, right? So that's something that's farther in the future. How far, we don't know, but it's still in the future. So what, did, what is this history then in relationship to this movement? Because I think that's the, the one thing that we've never really struggled with in our studies. I mean, it's been mentioned and touched on. You know, it's sort of been, you know, alluded to. We've, we've you know, we've dealt with early writings, page 74, and we've addressed it to some degree. That we're repeating that history. So the question is, um, you know, is Judges 8, this whole history dealing with Ephraim, is this going from December 25th, 2021, to whatever this event is in the future? Can we at least entertain that idea? I believe we would have to entertain that idea. Yeah. And, and we already have this date in the future. That is, we have the date of April 5th, 2030. So I'm not saying that April 5th, 2030 is the arrival of the fourth angel. But it's the symbol that we have is that is this history. Um, but maybe what we could... So I'm going to do it this way. And I don't know if this is the best way to do it. Um, but we need a history here as well, which we have as um, that these histories are connected, right? These, these way marks. So, I know this doesn't really make much sense, uh, just the way I'm doing it here. It's maybe not the best way to do it, but it's the way I'm gonna do it. So just to see that, that this, which we would say, um, you know, is 1863, it's that history of the rejection of the first and second angels messages all the way up to 1888. So. That is the way that Jeff used to do this is he would put a one, two, three here. He'd put a small tick down here, and that would be one, and this would be the second angel, and this would be the third angel on this side of this. And he would do these in all these way marks. So you would have uh, the first, second, and third angel's message, and you would have the fourth. And, and this wasn't really clear um, when we addressed our history, we would just put this forth as, you know, the time 9-11, the time we're in. But really, after each reform line, after the third angel arrives, there's a falling away. That is, there's the rejection of the first, second, and third angel's message in the first generation. So in Millerite history, that's from 1844 to 1888. So, that, so there's this rejection of this message. And then the second generation begins. Now, what's the problem with the second generation? Beside the fact that it doesn't understand the um, path of the first. Okay, so it it has an understanding of the first 
not like the fourth generation. The fourth generation has forgotten its history completely. Correct. But the second generation ha hasn't had the experience of the first generation. All right, I can agree with that. So, so that, and, and that's why Jeff puts the first generation. He doesn't really start it in 1844. He actually starts it in 1798, right? So he has to go from 1798 to 1888. He calls that the first generation. But, but I really think that that's, I mean, that first generation is born in the Millerite period, right? from 1840 to 44. So in some ways you might even say the first generation starts in 1840, but, but those are minor little details. Um, just depends on, on the perspective that you're looking at. But the second generation doesn't have the experience, but we know that when we get to the fourth generation and we have this major reform line, which is in, in, in our history, this is, this repeat of Millerite history, we're actually experiencing Millerite history. The second generation doesn't do that. And we, we can see the problems that existed in the second generation. Uh, worldliness had crept in. Uh, prosperity. You know, so like in 1863, Adventists are poor. I mean, there might be a few people with money, but, but the whites are living in pretty much what I would call abject poverty right, in that early history. I mean, by comparison of our standards today, and even by the comparison of the second generation, second generation is fairly prosperous. So, and then you have the third generation. What's the problem with the thir third generation? It understands nothing of the first and second and doesn't have the experience of either. Yeah. So it's after the rejection of the first, second, and third angels' messages. It is now, uh, in, in Adventism, it's the books of a new order, right? So they're pursuing the Protestant method of study. They want acceptance. And then the fourth generation is the period of darkness. So the fourth generation has no no memory of the first generation. Adventists in general, and I would say by in general, like the vast, vast majority, have very little understanding of Millerite history. Even the conservative Adventists, their understanding of Millerite history is, is muddied at best. Right? They, it, it's, it's been rewritten uh, to fit the the modern agenda for the church. And so, you know, what you see in these generations is this desire to do the Lord's work, so to speak, right, to evangelize the world, but they don't have a message. They don't have the message of Adventism. And so they use the world's methods. They have the world's message. And they think it's wonderful light. You know, they can, they can talk about, you know, we need to know Jesus, we need to know Christ, but they have no idea what that even means, right? It's just a bunch of words. And this has always been the problem that I've seen in Adventism, is that Adventists don't know Christ, even though they used to, right? Because the Christ that they've adopted is the Christ that I rejected. That's the Christ I grew up with that was being foisted upon me by the various different churches that did not align with my knowledge of Christ. The Christ I was looking for was the Christ of Adventism, which is a completely different Christ. You know, we may have the same name, you know, we call him Jesus, Jesus Christ, but when you look at how Protestants perceive who Jesus is, it's completely different than Adventists do, or at least it used to be. And so it's it's always been a struggle for me to, in being an Adventist, seeing Adventists who don't know who Christ is. And they don't, why, why don't they like the true Christ? Why do they like this whitewashed Christ, I, you know, for lack of a better word? 
what is it about the Christ that that the evangelical world, the Christian world, uh, likes? Their attitude is that this is a Christ that has taken away sin and that we don't need to hold on to any law, that we don't have to abide by law. We just need to abide by love. Right. So it's this this really loving Christ, but it's not really love. I mean, it. and, and I don't spend time watching all these new Christian shows and stuff, but there's the new picture of Christ for the 21st century is um, what they would call more human. Um, which is, is in some ways different from the, the extreme sort of far away Christ that, that used to happen. But, but what's the problem with it? I mean, you're, you're touching on it here. It's about this love and acceptance so Galatians 1, verse 6 to 10. I don't know if Angela's answering this question. I, am, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ but though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man may preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. For I do not now persuade men or God, for do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. So that, that last verse answers it. So the, what they are trying to do is make a Christ that is attractive. Would that be a, the best way to explain it? No. They're, what they're trying to do is they're trying to make a Christ that is attractive to a man that wants to hold on to their sins. Right. So they're making Christ attractive to oh, the world. man. So it's the worldly man, right? It's it's making Christ attractive to human nature. Yeah, they're basically, you know, they view the sacrifice of Christ as being completely completed, finished, and that there's nothing that we are to do. They don't view that man is to also... <clears throat> give up their sins, that they have to give their sins to Christ. This is why they've continued in this issue regarding righteousness by faith. Because they believe that all they have to do is believe that Christ has done it all and that we don't have to do anything. Yeah. So you're talking about in Adventism, what we've seen over the last 40, 50, 60 years or more. I'm talking when about. You, go I'm ahead. Sorry. Wouldn't you call that a goodly, goodly religion that focuses on the love of Jesus and nothing else? It that's possible, but I mean, what what I'm looking at with this is is not just within Adventism. I mean, this is in agreement with so much of what's been going on within the world as well, because. Many evangelical churches take that righteousness by faith is nothing more than believing that Christ has accomplished everything and that we have nothing to do. Yeah, well, yeah, and I would agree. In the group that I was with, sorry, just to back up what uh, Dwight was saying, in the group that I was with, they had this theory this abominable theory of vicarious atonement so we were then free to do whatever we please because christ was carrying all our sins and we were unaccountable and i know what eg white says about that that it's a total devilish abomination 
Okay. Um, so I think we're kind of talking about something different. So I understand, you know, about the theological explanation of righteousness by faith, but that's not what we're talking, what I'm asking about, or what I'm thinking about. It has to do with who Christ is, how he's depicted in in the Christian media. So there used to be a time when Christ was depicted as far away, you know, in the clouds of heaven, so to speak. You know, you'd see him in, in pictures surrounded by angels. And, and a change happened within Christianity that made Christ more familiar. Right? I can agree. Yeah, it wasn't, there, there was no reverence for Christ. And, and and a lot of people embrace this idea. I mean, part of it is the, um, you know, we'd go back to, you know, even the 1960s, you know, the hippie movement and all that, that kind of stuff, um, that we needed this more relatable Christ. Now, in some ways, you know, that's not, that's not necessarily wrong because Christ, you know, he was friends with the disciples. But um, in some ways, they have made him uh, more accessible. Yeah, so the 1960s, the Vatican II. That's definitely the part the Catholics had to play. So that's where they introduced, you know, folk music into the churches. And, of course, they got rid of Latin mass. And, and, and they wanted to reach out to the Protestants to bring them back into the fold through this by changing the face of Catholicism, well, not really changing its its root. Um, we, so, yeah, you have a thought. Would, would it be unconditional love? Oh no, there's nothing wrong with unconditional love. It, it, I mean, it depends what you mean by that. I mean, God loves every everything that He's ever made. But if you mean by unconditional love, unconditional acceptance, that would be something different. But even then, that can be redefined in different ways. Um, you know, the point is, God does love us, right? And he, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So to me, that's unconditional love. But if you mean that God just accepts all men just as they are, and they don't need to change. And it's just us having to accept that God loves us, that we want to be with him. You know, that would be a distortion of the gospel. So would you, would you call that marvelous love instead of unconditional? Because unconditional would say that you, you, you can do anything you want to and you still be accepted. No, you're saying acceptance. You did. So I love my children unconditionally. I love them no matter what they do. Uh, doesn't mean I'm, I'm going to accept what they do. Okay. Right. But I know words, words are, have been twisted around to mean different things. So, so it's sometimes difficult to just, you have to look at what's actually being done, not what's being said. And so in the world, of Christianity presently, people, Christians will just do whatever and feel that it's okay. Right? So, you know, I had a, an employee used to go to the City Life Church here in Leduc, and people would just sleep around with each other, the young people, because it was all young people, and, and it wasn't condemned. Right. So, you know, that's just the way the Christian world has gone. So the Christian world is just the world in the church. But the main point that I'm trying to address here, I guess, is. Um, you know, when we get to the fourth generation. We have a form of godliness without the power of God, that is Christianity has turned into um, all pretense and no substance. People aren't interested 
in knowing of a Christ that is offering you um, his character. That we have to take up our cross daily and follow him. That the only, the only path to God is by yoking up with Christ. And yet people present a, a type of gospel that appeals to human nature. I mean, they, by using a Christ that appeals to human nature. So, I mean, it's a rather complicated issue because there's, there are lots of different types of Christs for different people. But when we get to the... He did warn us of false Christs and false prophets abounding in these last days. Right. So, so any, any way that you are, any way you are naturally, there is a Christ brand out there for you. You can, you can be the type of Christian who does all kinds of good works um, to make yourself feel better about yourself. You know, so it appears on the surface sort of a sacrifice, but everybody just does really what they want. They join the church that appeals to their personality and desires and interests, right? Does that make sense? I think you're beginning to make a good Sadly, point. Sadly, it was. Yeah. You know, and, and, and see, part of it, you know, that I see, in, and this is just my perspective of looking at Adventism, but, you know, when I, before I became an Adventist, I'd read a book called um, Antichrist 666. It was about the, the various conspiracy theories, um, you know, based partly on truth, but a lot of error mixed in. And so, you know, and I also had a friend before that, even before when I was like 10 or 12 years old, somewhere in there, who was a fairly intelligent kid. And he was interested in all kinds of alternative views of the world. You know, he believed in, in the flat earth as well as the hollow earth at the same time, which didn't make any sense to me. But anything that he could find that was highly speculative uh, he was interested in so you know that would be you know holocaust denial anything right stuff i didn't even know anything about at that age um but you know when we look at adventism what i see what i saw when i became an adventist is that there were people who um we're just living, we're, we're, you know, and this is judging other people from, you know, from my perspective, but they just were in it for whatever it was that they could gain. And for different people, it was different things. Some, it was being extremely strict to them. That was their sin, right? So they'd be really strict about diet and judging everybody who didn't eat like them. For some, it would be, some doctrine or belief that they had and it, and it might even be a true belief but it was a way of affirming that they were better than other people and this is what i've seen mostly in my christian life is that people believe things or take positions or stances it's almost like um you know we we wear whatever uniform of whatever fantasy we were in, right? So within the world, you see people, you know, who dress like cowboys because they live in a cowboy fantasy. You know, they're not really cowboys. They just dress like cowboys. And you see people who, who dress like rock stars, right? They're not rock stars at all. They don't even play instruments, but they want to look like they're heroes. You see Christians who, who dress in fancy suits. You see Christians who do all these different types of things, but all of this is play acting Right? It's all something to make them feel better about themselves. Now, that's my, my perspective. Whether that's correct or not about all the different people I saw, I don't know. But that's what I saw, is that people were, you know, they could be religious fanatics about some issue, 
but they're not interested in examining truth. Nobody's interested in being corrected. Nobody's really interested in the cross of Christ. And that was true in our movement as well. People, people like to talk about how bad the Catholics are or how bad the church is or how bad someone else is. But they're never going to take that criticism and direct it at themselves. Because the whole reason that they're, they're in this religion is to cover up the fact that they are sinners and not actually address the sin problem. So that's my very harsh judgment of other people. So I could be wrong about some of the people I've judged in that sense. But it's just a perspective that I have is that people are playing these roles. They're trying to find an identity that isn't in Christ. And of course, people could look at me and judge me on the same basis. They could say, well, you're just interested in these, you know, the chronology and stuff so you can feel better about yourself. And people in this movement, some of them have that opinion about me, right? So, so we can't really judge one another. We don't know. With what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. With what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. Right? So, so when we're trying to address these lines, what we are, are supposed to be seeing is ourselves. And, and we can see that where we're leading to is the upper room. Right? That's where these lines are leading to. And we have this reform line that shows up again and again. The first angel arrives. There's this increase of light. The second angel arrives. There's a separation of the classes that happens here. And then we have a message that's given to the world that's proclaimed with a loud cry, right? The midnight cry. And then this test comes, the Sunday law. But in all of these histories of the past, that third angel is never empowered. Instead, we have a history that is the falling away. Now, whether that's the right date to put there or not, I don't know. But, but this then leads to a repeat of history. So all of this history that happened here now has to be done again. Right? That, that's how we would look at these lines if we're going to take Millerite history. So when we look at this line, I mean, this obviously isn't a worldwide line. This is an internal line. So, so what does this mean? If we look at this story of Gideon, um, all of the things that happen in it, because there's lots that happens in these three chapters, and we're trying to put these on a line. Is there something in our experience that this movement is right now in a falling away, but that it has to move to what, whatever that history is to, to be united, to actually accomplish the task that was given to us and and i don't know i don't know the answer to that question what's going to happen to this movement any thoughts on that i mean i did lots of rambling there but <clears throat> I know I said months ago that as far as I could see, the only thing that was going to help help us to unite is persecution. I mean, okay. if folks aren't ready each day to get, get before God and plead with him to, to keep leading them forward, then we'll, we'll, I don't think we're going to remain in the state that we're in. I mean, the ones that who don't want to move forward whether they're aware of it or not, are going to be lost. They're going to fall back into the world. And those that, uh, and we'll all, because they have been with us at one point, they're going to fa face, face persecution too. I mean, look at the trial of Christ, right? Uh, what, what, 
what occurred with Peter there and the rest of them. They all forsook him and fled. They denied him and so on and so forth. I mean, we, we have to each, each one of us, despite all our shortcomings and because of our shortcomings, say, please, Lord, renew me and help me to keep going forward. Because, I mean, what are we going to go, to go back to? I'm thinking about my past and there's no way I want to touch on that again. Hmm. Well, the only reason, why, why did God's people get persecuted? It's just bearing his name for one thing, Christian. Okay, so you get persecuted when you're following the truth. But you can also, because certain folks are were, were associated with the ones that Satan and his people hate the most, they will also face it. And what are they going to do? Of course, they're going to betray and turn us in, right? If they can. Yeah. So though they're not going to be, they're not going to be brought together into the upper room because of persecution. No. Right. So I, I don't know. I, I never bought into the persecution idea that, you know, once we're persecuted, then the church is going to be uh, unified. I think actually the unity comes first and the persecution follows. Well, what about the, the ones ones who are straggling the straddling the fence right now in this movement? Well, I don't know. I don't know how persecution is going to change that. And, and even yeah, if I, yes, this is <clears throat> this is what I'm thinking of too. I mean, each uh, each of us every day has to decide to recommit to Christ. If we're not willing to do that. <sighs> When things get really hot, they the the ones who are fence straddling now will fall. They're 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 already falling. They'll just topple right over and turn on us. More much more than they have now. You know, it, it it defines it refines the ones who want to go forward with Christ, or it cleaves the ones who do not want to to go back entirely. Well, all I know, so I, I, I don't know what's going to happen. All I know is that we're being called to this individual work. We need to trust that God has a purpose and a plan. We don't know how that's going to unfold. But we do have these lines that tell us what has happened in the past. None of these lines give us a really promising outlook for the present. Right. That is, you know, God's people seem to wander away. Now, we do have some examples where things happen differently. The upper room. Right. How the Millerites, you know, the small group that were left, Ellen White, James White, and those around them, how they came together. Uh to accomplish the work that God gave them to do, which was to establish, uh, you know, mission stations all around the world to give the, this message to the world. If that work hadn't been done, we wouldn't even know about Millerites, right? So all this work that was done in the past is a foundation that has been laid. But also there's been, you know, the church has failed in its mission. James and White, James and Ellen White succeeded in what God had given them to do. But the church has failed in that mission. And so it seems that this has been handed over to this small movement uh, to accomplish this work, which seems rather uh, egocentrical. You know, it seems a little bit unlikely that God could choose us but God always does that. He takes the weak things of the world to confound the wise. And even within this movement, I mean, we in essentially are the outcasts of this movement itself. So, you know, the question is, what is God going to do? How are these lines going to help us?
So when we, it's it, the problem comes when we get to this third way mark, the third angel arriving, right? Because as we look at these lines here, so we've taken this line of Gideon, and then it, this becomes even more problematic when we get to the story of Samson. But in this line of Gideon, we can see that um, we've had these, uh, you know, the messages of Odilio and Colin. We've had the studies that we began, the Fleece 1 and the Fleece 2, March 7th and December 26th, 2021, which it was the examining the foundation, and now we're understanding the lines. And these, in our understanding, these have led us to this date, which is now past, but at the time was still future, January 11th to 12th, 2023, 2,640 days before um, April 5th, 2030. So we have this future date, which we don't know what it means, right? But how is this going to help us not make the mistakes of the past? How is this going to help us to see who we really are and to trust in God completely? Because we know there will be a final generation that will reflect Christ's character. And, you know, ever since I've been an Adventist, I've wondered about this. How does that come about? I mean, how does that come about, not just in my own life, but, you know, that we have 144,000 living saints who do not uh, taste death, who go through the time of Jacob's trouble and reflect Christ's character even in the most trying circumstances. And if we if we can't, if if this movement cannot um, have the experience of the disciples in the upper room, which precedes the day of Pentecost, if we can't have that experience, I don't see how we can be a part of that final generation. And so I know these lines are giving us this information, but is, is it really even making sense to us? You know, are we just as superficial as all the other Christians? Are we just as uh, deceived in the sense of who we are, even if this is all truth, how we see ourselves, are we deceiving ourselves? Are we any different than those that wrote the declaration on December 6th or published that declaration. Uh, battle is just to die to self, be willing to die to self each day. I mean, if we, I know if I start to get lifted up, the Lord is sure to slap me down. Yeah, well. And we need to ask him, ask him to do that. There is no good in ourselves with what he has instilled in us. And one of the great things that he's instilled in me, even when I was so astray, was a fervor for truth. I was determined I was going to find the truth no matter how hard it was. Yeah, because I, I want to be a, an experience that's based upon reality, not fantasy. Right? Because I value something that's real. That is, if I'm going to trust in something, I don't want to trust in something that's just a fantasy in my own mind. That's why I like these objective numbers. But I guess the thing that I'm struggling with is the subjective nature of what we're doing. So we have all of these symbols. We can see that these are correct. We can see that they fit into these structures. But the subjective part here is, what does this mean, right? that that's the thing that i'm struggling with what does it mean what is this what is this message about and you know maybe my my fault is sort of focusing upon how hopeless the situation looks you know as i as i think about you know the camp meeting this summer is that even going to be of any use as far as this movement is concerned if nobody's interested in it 
you know, if it's just the people who are here in the morning. I certainly am. Yeah. It's just a matter of getting there and getting back, you know, like I, of course I want to attend, but I don't have right now. No, I have no means of getting there. Yeah. Well, you can so, leave that and go. But I know that, I mean, I, I hitchhike lots of times, right. And the Lord has raised up people, but also hitchhiking has gotten me sun, near sunstroke, hyperthermia, near hypothermia, pneumonia, and a host of things that I would rather, like my health isn't as great as it was yeah. prior to this COVID crap, right? So yeah. I'm thinking of this, I said, Lord, you're, if you want me there, then you're going to have to open the way for me to get there safely and back again. And I also have friends back east who, who want to see me and family, some of my family. Mm -hmm. So there's some incentive there. Yeah, but, but that's not really the point i mean whether where they are not it's it's the people who who need to be there the people in this movement and and what i'm struggling with is you know are the people that are in this movement now are are they going to still continue to be in this movement you know that's but, that's so theodore that's up to them and god that has nothing to all you can do is set forth the call as you've been faithfully doing i understand that but that's that's not what i'm talking about it's like are we we focusing upon the are we putting our energies into a place that's not going to be productive right so so the question is what is our responsibility right now you know what is my responsibility okay continue doing what we're doing yeah and then ask him if he wants us to do more to open the doors for us to be able to do more it's all him we're just playing mm -hmm. a small role in this but it's a very important role right so so it's it's a responsibility is the way i look at it and so if i have a responsibility i want to make sure that i i take that, that responsibility seriously and i do what's being asked of me not something oh, so so when i look at these lines and i'm trying to sort out what's happening i mean i'm thinking about what's immediately in front of us how do these lines relate to it and if we're going to look at ephraim as being um to some degree this movement at large and we're going to see that there's this progression of Ephraim ultimately rejecting this message. I mean, I guess we just have to continue giving this message. But I would love to see everybody come together and, and accept this message and then work together to accomplish a task. But it doesn't seem to me that that's necessarily what the lines are showing. Like, we do need to come to the upper room. But... But it doesn't seem to me that, you know, that the thing that I would want to see is what the lines are showing. They're not showing me what I want to see. Right? They show more separation. Even though we are to come to the upper room, that's shown to us. It, it's also we see that there's a separation that occurs. And that's the part I don't want to see. So maybe there I are seven, I, seven thousand. There are seven thousand symbolically that we don't even know of that god will raise up to replace those who fall away in this movement we have to have that type of faith right so so we can't be presenting a message that's going to be attractive to human nature which is what most people want right most people want to to have a form of godliness but not the power of god and that's just that's just a reality of human nature so for us not to have that as a desire is a miracle of Christ. It's a miracle of his truth, of his converting power. But there, there are that 144,000 that are going to complete the work are still out there. Right? God's working on them in all kinds of ways. We just don't know who they are. And maybe we, you know, we never will until you know, Christ comes back. We may feel all alone. That's right. And that's the vision that we have to have. Lord, we don't know. We're just carnal, finite beings, just doing what we can do. But there are multitudes that are going to flock in. He's promised that. Mm -hmm. 
He's promised it in Revelation 14, for example, a multitude that no man could number. You know, where did they all come from? They weren't always from be long before us. They're end time people too. So, so maybe these um, these efforts that we're making within the movement are just needful from a character perspective, um, even if even if it doesn't accomplish what we want it to accomplish. Okay, so well, we're not we're not getting very far here in these in these studies, but I, I do need to sort out these lines in some way. So, you know, we're going to be praying about this till we come together on Sunday. Um, oh, and one other question. Um, this Sunday, the afternoon studies, uh, I want to cancel them for this Sunday. I don't like canceling studies, but um, we have to go to Calgary and it would be too much of a rush to have this study unless somebody wants to take up the study and do some other thing or do some other presentation. Does anybody want to do a study on Sunday afternoon? On, on this. I could try it. I had started writing something just on faith from, from the, well, from, well, from the yeah, Bible I, and the spirit of prophecy. Yeah, I would want it to be on on the simplicity of the lines. The line. simply, okay. simply. Well, I'm no expert on that. So. <laughs> it's just, you know, so we could put that study off uh, for a week. Um, okay. Um, any final thoughts before we close with prayer? I know I keep struggling with the same things. I, f I feel like sometimes I'm talking like Mark, um, Mark Owen, when he uh, always keeps repeating himself. But uh, so I apologize, Ken. But anyway, we have a lot to study still. And um, let's close with prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven. Um, we are very grateful for each person studying these truths. You know that we are struggling to understand these lines and what they mean to us today. Uh, we want to do what you are asking us to do and that you've given us this line so that we can all see what our present duty is, that we can examine them together. And um, we pray for this movement, for the people in it, the precious souls that are around us looking for truth. We ask that you can use us in reaching them. Help us in our personal ministry to others. May your angels be around us. May your Holy Spirit speak to their hearts. We pray that you can um, be with us throughout this day until we meet again on Friday evening to study righteousness by faith. And... Um, Help us to experience uh, true faith. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.